Good day everyone. In today's video, I'm going to talk about the advantages of using Cubase and its built-in control room when using correction software such as Sonarworks Reference 4. Okay, so for those of you who are not familiar with Sonarworks Reference or any similar type of software, basically the gist of it is that in any one given room, there's size that determines how the room is going to sound. Uh, everything that's in the room, the surface areas, the furniture, the monitors that you're actually using, all these things play into how you're actually going to hear the sounds that's coming out of the speakers. And by that I mean the perception of what's getting into your ears in whatever place you are, where your monitors are, where every all these factors, that is never going to be exactly represented from what's in the DAW, what's in the computer, in the actual raw audio file or raw audio source. Everything is colored in some sort of way. And there are companies such as Sonarworks who build software that essentially try to help and ameliorate any problems that you have with your exact particular room and listening position and monitors. And the way they do this is they have these microphones that are specially tuned uh, let me just get this a close-up here. So these microphones are specially tuned to try and have the flattest response um, of all the frequency ranges. Of course, not every microphone is going to be perfect. And so they then measure these microphones and create a kind of snapshot of what this microphone is, whether it's completely flat or it has a, a peak at uh, a certain range or a dip in another range, it's also going to offset the measuring device itself so that it's as flat as possible with the use of software. You then go through this entire measurement step with like, I don't know, 50 to 70 different measurement points in your exact room location with your speakers at a set volume. It does all these calculations and determines exactly what your room quote unquote sounds like. There's a snapshot, the tonal characteristic snapshot of your room. So here you can see this is what I've done with mine. I have Neumann KH120s and then I have a, a sub which is crossed over at 100 hertz. And I went through this entire measuring process and actually I'm going to pull up some pictures to kind of give you a, a, a sense of what's going on with my setup. Okay, so here's uh, three separate snapshots that I did before I ever had the Neumann KH120s. I had Yamaha HS5s with a sub. And this was my first measurement. And you can see how there's a right and a left speaker. They differentiate bef between them with measurements on either side. And you go up to the speakers and whatnot. So you can see this is the actual variation with these speakers in my room. There's dips, there's peaks. And when you look at this area here, this is about 12 decibel boost at 100 hertz that I had in my room kind of unknowingly. And this was severely and negatively affecting my mixing experience because all my instruments to me in my, in my head, in my ear, in my perception sounded like there was plenty of 100 hertz and probably plenty of punch in the kick uh, and whatnot and bass and low end in the bass. But in actuality, I'm probably mixing roughly 12 decibels lower than I should be in the actual DAW, something to that effect. Now, after I took this measurement, it was surprising. What I did was I, I lowered the actual sub cut out a uh, crossover frequency to 100 hertz and I turned the volume down on the sub and I progressively got a little bit closer to or at least better results that are a, bit, a little bit closer to zero the zero flat mark 
So this was the kind of the final result. There's now a little bit more balance between this area being closer, hovering around 100 hertz. So what's cool is this thing, this measured, it gave me an exact snapshot on what I needed to do to my monitors to get, um, to get as flat a response as I could in my room. So that was for the HS5s. And this snapshot here is with my uh, Neumann KH120s. And you can see it's, it's a little bit better. It's a little bit more centered around zero and doesn't ever cross any more than maybe five to six decibels away from the flat zero response. And again, this was an improvement because what I could do is in the back of these monitors, they have more options than the Yamahas. I tuned them to my liking so that when the reflections hit off of my desk, it's not giving me too much uh, low mids. I also did a little bit of rearranging of my room so that I had more strategic placement of all my uh, acoustic foam. But what also is crucially important is that you get the position of your speakers as far as um, position in the room, but also equidistant from each other and your listening position in an equidistant triangle. And then having your listening position in the room be accurate and, and in an optimal position to avoid all the nasty reflections that cause uh, issues with, with monitoring. The software, what it does is it gets the measurement of your listening environment and then it calibrates and offsets. It compensates for any peaks and valleys in your, uh, in your listening space and it reintroduces that into the actual raw audio signal. And there's two ways of introducing that. There's either as the program that's playing out of your computer, out of your sound card uh, at all times, or you can insert it as a plugin in your DAW. So in most DAWs, you just put the plugin uh, on your studio, your two bus, your studio monitor, output bus, whatever that is. And that's how it gets calibrated. It now uh, sends out signals that are calibrated to your room so that what you hear is more perfectly flat as far as frequency range. Now, most DAWs do not have the advantage that Cubase has with the control room. And let me explain. I've had this many, many times in other DAWs, even though I know that once I'm done monitoring and mixing, I have to disable this plugin because it's actually coloring the audio coming out of the DAW. So if I was to export this accidentally with this plugin enabled, it's coloring the actual audio being exported in the audio file, the final export. You do not want that at all. And Almost every other DAW, except for Cubase and Nuendo that I know of, has this brilliant feature of um, control room, which allows you to put inserts only on the monitoring aspect of it. So, so instead of having to continually disable and enable in this section, instead what you can do is go into the control room and you can put any number of plugins and it will color that monitoring chain only. When I go to export this, it's not going to uh, apply these plugins to the export file. So I can leave Sonarworks Reference 4 enabled at all times so that I always have a corrected monitoring environment and never have to worry about disabling it and re-enabling it whenever I go back and do some mixing. And again, I've run into this almost every single time in other DAWs like Ableton, Bitwig. Those are two other DAWs that I actually use. And I try to have my sonar reference as I'm building songs and producing music and mixing uh, in each DAW that I use. But in those DAWs, I always have to remember. And I've probably wasted, I don't know how many times or how much time 
in in minutes or hours, even this like past few months, where I've accidentally exported it with SonarWorks uh, enabled, and then I had to go back into it, re take it off, <laughs> re export it, um, and then continue on my merry way. Now the other added benefit to Cubase's um, control room is that you also have separate monitor feeds. So let me just kind of walk through in more detail what Control Room is compared to other DAWs. So you have here the outputs that route through your audio interface. And then this separate tab, your Control Room, whenever you have this enabled, you can go in and assign separate headphone mixes, separate monitor mixes, and you can even add a talkback mic, separate external inputs, and you can add uh, cue mixes. And in this particular example, I'm going to show with different sets of monitors, clearly you're going to have a different set of measurements with this tool. And you can also have a different measurement or a preloaded measurement for headphones of a particular brand or a particular make and model. So if you route your outputs through the control room out through your audio interface accordingly, I could have three separate stereo mixes. And then in my control room, I could then be uh, inserting three separate instances of SonarWorks reference. You see here, I can go into the headphones and then I can add SonarWorks to this as well. And then instead of having to flip through my presets um, every time I switch a monitoring system and then I have to go in and change the preset here, I could just always have this activated as my headphone snapshot that calibrates what's playing through my headphones. Uh, through my main monitors, I can have my KH120 snapshot. And then if I set up a separate third set of monitors as monitor C, then I can have another snapshot preloaded for that particular monitor set. So I hope that all makes sense. And you can see now why with Control Room, this makes everything a lot more streamlined. You set it and forget it, and you save how much time from not accidentally uh, two, there's two different things that can happen here. You can accidentally mix without the plugin, realize after how much time you spent mixing in, an, in a non-calibrated environment, and then you realize you can't trust what you were hearing before. And you got to go back, go back to the mix, maybe do some tweaks there. That's on the, the mix side of things. Then there's the export side of things where you accidentally leave the plugin on, and then you have to re-export it, you know, causing how many minutes, hours of wasted time. So yes, anyways, I think that's kind of sums everything up here real nicely. But uh, this is just kind of one of the benefits of using Control Room. Um, I also mentioned that there's queue mixes that you can set up. And what's uh, fantastic about that is that you can go into... Uh, your mix control, and let's say you're doing a recording session with um, with a vocalist, and they, they you have like some pre-recorded drums, bass, guitar, and the vocalist is coming in, and they want to hear uh, reverb and delay on their vocal. You can now, with Control Room, very easily just get a quick cue mix, send them the right amount of drums, bass, guitar, etc., and on their cue mix, you just add a reverb plugin here. So it's never on the recording part of it. It's never uh, recorded into the audio file. And then it's never going to be exported accidentally either. And you can kind of just have that as like a preset that you that you have for uh, for certain cue mixes. And then also when you're working with cue mixes, is, is let's say you have a live off the floor band where people need a certain amount of uh, of one particular instrument, whereas the other person, like a bass player, they need kick, drum, and snare more than anything, and maybe the vocal. 
You can do all these separate Q mixes once you have this properly set up uh, in Cubase. And those Q mixes um, are set up in the control room. Uh, so I highly uh, suggest you get to know control room and start learning how to use it properly and put it into your workflow. And then the offshoot benefit of this is that you have the fully featured metering. So you have loudness metering with integrated short-term and momentary loudness. You have range, true peak, uh, and then you have another just very basic uh, meter as like a, a main output metering. So lots of advantages for using Control Room. And I might do another video that gets a little bit more nitty gritty down to all the details and do a full tutorial on, on uh, Control Room. Oh, and one more thing that I didn't mention, which is a fantastic benefit as well, is every time I start a project, I know that there's certain plugins that I'm always going to use and always need. So one of them is the, the reference uh, plugin, but another bunch of them you can see here is um, Isotopes Insight, which is a fully featured uh, plugin that gives you a bunch of information about your audio source, like a spectrum, a sound field analyzer, all these things. Um, we have the Span, which is another thing that I use for a separate reason. Uh, the Tonal Control Room from, from Isotope, which is very handy. There's also this reference plugin that I've, I've grown to really like, and you can add in um, audio files from, from songs that you're trying to, to reference your mix to or your master to. And it's all built into the plugin and you have an easy A-B switch and then you can solo the different um, spectral ranges and it tells you lots of information. So anyways, all these plugins, once I load them in my uh, control room insert section and then I save this as a preset like I've done here, now every time I open up Cubase, that is what automatically shows up. So when I start a project from scratch, I don't have to put all these plugins on the master bus. And I mean, I, what I could do is create uh, a project template that has these things uh, on the master bus, but this kind of just eliminates that entire need altogether. It's, it's in its own preset for your monitoring purposes. And then no matter what comes in and out of this uh, project, whether I'm recording and I get an input source, I'm going to be able to go into span and see the frequency spectrum. Likewise, anything that's recorded into or being produced out of a VST instrument or something is going to play back and I'm going to be able to use these plugins to analyze the audio. And then the final sort of cherry on the cake is that it's always going to be after all my processing. So in this case, I'm using a limiter and it's it's the final part of the stage. If I had all my plugins on the master bus, I would have to make sure that they're all at the end after this, this uh, limiter plugin. And I might have to shuffle things around and make room for it. Then there's the added sort of thing that maybe I would accidentally have it as pre-fader or something to that nature. Like, you just eliminate so much complication by having it in control room and it's built into a separate monitoring environment as far as the inserts go. Oh boy. So I'm going to get, <laughs> and you know what, just a few more quick points because now I'm like looking at this thing and I keep remembering. So I'm going to make a full tutorial on this, but now think about this. So all the things that I've said that if that didn't sell you already, the fact that you can switch between your monitors at the click of a button. So you don't have to have a separate hardware unit that switches between different monitoring setups. It's all built into the software right here with buttons. You also have an automatic dim feature. So you can dim the, the audio playback at a preset uh, signal value. You also have the ability to down mix your stereo or whatever mix it is to mono directly. So you're monitoring mono at a click of a button. Um, you can turn on and off any of your mix 
So let's say I wanted to go into my headphones and mix, but I don't want to he hear the speakers. I just click this button here. It's no longer sending output to the speakers. I don't have to like go to my power switch and shut it off or turn off my output on my interface, which is more cumbersome. It's just a click of a button. So anyways, that wraps it up. I'm spieling to no end and ranting and raving about how awesome this is. Um, so hope you liked that video. Like I said, I will probably do another tutorial video specifically on Control Room and cover a whole bunch of these points, maybe more in depth. Um, but uh, one of those immediate things, and the reason why I'm making this video, <laughs> specifically about the reference plugin, like I initially started with, is in, in this last three weeks, I've been producing a few songs through Ableton and Bitwig, and I've wasted clear like over an hour guaranteed of having to re-export uh, songs. So it's um, it's sparked something in me to remember back when I never had to do that because I was using Cubase, and then uh, it gave me a whole sort of video idea. But anyways. Thanks for watching, take care, and see you in the next one. Bye-bye.